Ticks, ticks, mindless parasites with microscopic fangs. In earlier times, they were nothing more than an annoyance. Disgusting little blood-gorged creatures you pried off the dog with tweezers and burned in your father's ashtray. Insignificant pests. While these tiny nuisances have morphed into something altogether different, a thing as dreaded as an anaconda. A bite from a tick these days can change one's life dramatically. The tick-borne illness Lyme disease can cause serious, debilitating, and long-term joint, heart, brain, and central nervous system problems if not caught early and treated appropriately. The Center for Disease Control reports the number of Lyme cases diagnosed annually at about 300,000, and that's just reported cases. Of the long list of things to be frightened of in this day and age, this lurking creep the size of a sesame seed is right near the top. Welcome to the JFK Middle School in Northampton. I'm Bob Flaherty, along with Denise Fozella, Bill Newman, Kristen Palpini, Lori Loisel, and Al Williams as we present a live community forum, TikTok, sponsored by the Valley Medical Group and Valley Home Improvement. This is a classic media collaboration between WHMP, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and Northampton Cable TV as we look for answers as to what you can do to protect yourself from Lyme disease and what you should do if you have it or you think you may have it. One thing we'll hope to get to the bottom of is chronic Lyme. Some doctors say it doesn't exist. Many beleaguered patients will swear to you it does, and with that comes the fear that it cannot be cured. Our panelists, UMass professor of microbiology, Stephen Rich, who runs a research laboratory with a primary focus on human malaria and tick-borne disease. And with the professor is Laura Miller, one of his students. Clinical psychologist and PhD, Sheila Statlander, an expert on mental health issues as a symptom of Lyme infection. Next to her, Maria Malagudi, the executive director of Lyme Disease Resource Center Incorporated in Northampton. And Dr. Charles Brummer of Northampton, who specializes in alternative and integrative medicine. And next to the doctor, college student Sydney Rackenberg Loisel, who suffered with Lyme disease since she was nine years old. Leading the questioning would be WHMB's new director, Denise Fazella, Bill Newman of WHMB's Bill Newman Show, and Kristen Palpini, the web editor of the Daily Hampshire Gazette. But TikTok is a community forum. To folks here at JFK, if you have a comment or question for our panel, Lori Loisel will find you. Just get her attention. She's got the mic. She's doing the Phil Donahue bit. And uh, just present your question to the panel, or, and, uh, and we'll follow that up. Now, if you, she also has notes. If you do not want to speak against the microphone, you can write something on a note. She has notepads, and we will read that uh, to the panel. We ask of our panelists and audience alike to be as concise as possible so that all voices can be heard. To those watching or listening at home, either call our producer, Michael Sokol, at 586-7140. He'll text your message to us. And you might also tweet comments or questions to hashtag TikTok. Uh, TikTok is simulcast on WHMP and NCTV. This will be rebroadcast tomorrow morning from 8 to 10 a.m. on WHMP 96.9 FM. 1400, 1600, 1240 AM, also live, stream, live streamed on whmp.com. Uh, to our panelists, feel free to jump right in. If a question is directed to a certain panelist and you have something to add to that, just go for it. Don't wait. For the purposes of radio, I'll do my best to identify who's speaking at any particular time. Um, so I guess we should get us going. To get us started, WHME News Director Denise Fazella. Well, it's great to see such a big crowd here. We're going to get to as many of your questions as we can. If you are tweeting tonight, it's TikTok, T-A-L-K. Just wanted to make sure that you got that right. But I'm going to start with Dr. Brummer. Why is Lyme disease so hard to diagnose? Is it hard to diagnose? Sometimes it's very hard to diagnose, and sometimes it's extraordinarily easy to diagnose. So classic cases in medicine, including classic cases of Lyme disease, are simple. Uh, anybody can know they got a tick bite and then they developed a fever, a headache, joint pain, and a bullseye rash. Couldn't be simpler. One of the simplest of all uh, classic uh, presentations to diagnose. That bullseye rash is considered pathognomonic for Lyme disease. No other, tick, no other uh, insect bite causes it. It doesn't occur with other types of problems. 
So if you see that bullseye rash, you're good. Unfortunately, depending on who you uh, look at, only about, or whose data you look at, only about 30 to 70 percent of people develop that classic bullseye rash, so it's easy not to. Not everybody gets a fever. Most people actually don't see the tick. In which case, Lyme disease can present just like a flu or a malaise, and people sort of pass it off. If they're not alert to pursuing it further, it can smolder for a long time like that. Go to the doctor. Looks like a viral illness. If you're not alert to that, you might just pass it off at that, even as a trained medical professional. So in which case, it can be very hard to diagnose. You haven't thought about it enough. So if a patient does come to you with flu-like symptoms, but they don't have that bullseye rash, uh, or any of the other telltale signs that are obvious for Lyme disease, well, how would you know to do a Lyme test? At what point would you do that? First of all, you have to remember where we live and how much Lyme disease we have here. So if you were in the middle of the country someplace where there's almost no Lyme disease, you wouldn't. But here, anybody that comes in with a fever that they can't explain and flu-like illnesses, you have to consider that as a possible diagnosis. Uh, an example was some friends of ours that were traveling uh, from Pennsylvania. They went up to Vermont. They camped out. On the way back, on their way back to Pennsylvania, they stopped into my office because their son had a fever. That's all. He'd been feverish for a few days. He wasn't eating. Um, that was the only symptom that he had. So as they left, I sent them over to the hospital to get a Lyme test, came back positive. And normally in the past, 15, 20 years ago, I would have told them he had a virus and sent them along the way. He didn't really look that bad. It, there was nothing specific, no rash. They didn't see a tick bite, etc. He had a very strongly positive uh, Lyme titer, which happened fast, and he got treated right away. So in this area, you always have to consider it. Do all doctors do that? <laughs> I wouldn't. No, it's hard for you to answer. For I all wouldn't doctors. dare try to speak for all doctors. <laughs> yeah. But are, are more doctors doing that in this area? In this area, I think most doctors will consider it. it. I'm still surprised sometimes, though, when a patient will come in and tell me that they had a tick bite, they had flu-like stuff, they had a they had a uh, joint pains and a headache, um, and. The doctor didn't consider it, didn't even think about it, um, and sent them home. Uh, only f uh, later did they discover that they actually had that disease. Kristen? Is there a difference between the symptoms for uh, chronic Lyme and when you just first get it? Uh, clearly, very, uh, two very different presentations and two very different problems. Uh, the classic acute Lyme disease presentation, even without it, if you pick it up, very straightforward. The chronic presentation is sometimes straightforward, but often not. Um, because Lyme can penetrate or does penetrate into tissues, it can show up any place. It can show up in the central nervous system as headaches uh, or as psychiatric, psychological problems, new onset or as gastrointestinal problems in somebody who doesn't have that before. I've seen now numbers of cases of people who come in with new onset anxiety or new onset depression with no other symptoms who turn out to have Lyme disease. I've had people who come in with new onset symptoms of what you might call irritable bowel syndrome with no other symptoms of Lyme disease who get diagnosed with it, get treated with antibiotics, and get better. So. How would you know? Maybe you get bit a couple years ago and you're just living with Lyme disease. You have no idea. How would you ever, how would you ever know? Again, almost similar to the way that you know whether somebody here has um, Lyme disease acutely when they present with nonspecific symptoms. If you have something nonspecific and you just wonder, I wonder if this could relate, just to keep it in the differential diagnosis of what may be going on. You're right, maybe it is just new onset anxiety. But if you did have a history of Lyme disease and it was not treated adequately and it shows up later as psychiatric disorder or neurologic disorder or gastrointestinal disorder, then you have to be thinking that that is in the differential diagnosis. That's where I see many doctors not paying attention. 
And quite honestly, if you had asked me this question a couple of years ago, am I going to see a lot of people with specific organ presentations of Lyme disease? I would have said, no, I don't think so. This is really a, a more like a rheumatologic disease that only shows up in joints. But now I know that that's not the case. I think the, the other problem uh, that is This is uh, Sheila Statlander speaking. Is that we have the diagnostic tests, the laboratory testing is extremely flawed. So we don't have good tests. The spirochete, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, is not easy to culture. Um, so, you know, that creates a lot of controversy and uncertainty in the field. Um, you know, the doctors, even the CDC says on its website that Lyme disease should be a clinical diagnosis with the lab tests used to back up um, the doctor's clinical impression and a careful history and risk of exposure. But in, you know, in today's busy world with, um, you know, kind of a lot of thoughts and concerns, um, often doc you know, doctors don't have time to do a quick test and that, you know, it would be nice if it were that easy. I have uh, mixed feelings about the term chronic Lyme disease because I think it's very, used very imprecisely. Um, there are people who are, who have been missed in the diagnosis, have significantly delayed onset and more complicated presentations. Um, it, common sense would say they might take longer to treat. Um, so do they have chronic Lyme? Do they have late stage Lyme? Do they have disseminated Lyme? So I think we need to define our terms a lot more carefully than than has been ha happening. Can you bring the microphone closer to you when you're talking? Maybe we all need to do that. Um, uh, Laura, you have uh, someone from the audience? Yeah. Hello, can you hear me now? Uh, my question concerns recurring Lyme disease. I had Lyme disease three years ago. I was treated with, you know, three weeks of doxycycline. I was able to stand up vertically. My muscle pain and joint pain and fever of 105 went away. I've been symptom free until I encountered another tick this spring. The symptoms immediately returned and I'd had another three week course of dox doxycycline. My question is, how safe and appropriate is this, this uh, course of three weeks of penicillin to continue, I mean, every time I meet a tick, am I going to am I going to uh, test positive for Lyme? What's what are uh, this is not a clear question, is it? Let me try again. Did you want to? You know, how safe is it to continue to treat recurring Lyme with a long course of penicillin? Stephen Rich. So so I'd answer your first question by saying you'll probably test positive for Lyme for a long time in that you'll have antibodies around that are evidence that you had that infection. Um, even when the infection goes away, you perhaps will still test positive. I wanted to go back to just the point about disease and just emphasize that disease is a complex state. It involves multiple factors. It involves infection with, Borrelia, with the causative agent of Lyme disease and maybe other things. It also involves the, state, the health of the person generally. So healthy, if a person is old, if they're young, if they have a competent immune response. And so to your point, defining disease has to be done very carefully. And one of the things that we know about disease is that there's probably a distribution of diseases. Think of a bell curve and think at one end there are people that get really sick, but there's also likely to people, be people at the other end that don't get very sick at all. And what's not known is we don't know what the shape of that curve looks like. And that's why we have so much debate about chronic Lyme versus non-chronic Lyme, is we don't know how many people get really sick, probably more people than get diagnosed currently, but there's also probably a large number of people that get infected that never get sick. What about recurring Lyme? Another encounter with another tick. I had all the symptoms, I found the tick. Um, are you asking so if you recommend uh, you know, continued treatment for these long courses of penicillin? So uh, your, quest, your question was how safe is it to take antibiotics recurrently if you have uh, tick exposure 
uh, tick exposure and uh, symptoms associated with that. Right. I, would re I would rephrase it as, in how safe is it not to take the treatment? Um, because the, the concern is under treatment or no treatment um, leaves you um, at high risk for long-term disability um, and long-term disease. It's good to minimize the amount of antibiotics that we take. I'm 100 percent on board with that. We don't want, making, we don't want to make any more anti, uh, antibiotic resistant bugs out there than, than we already have. We don't want to cause um, problems in our own gastrointestinal tract with Clostridium difficile overgrowths in our intestine and Candida overgrowths in our body. But you'd be taking a big risk not to treat Lyme disease after a tick bite with symptoms. Um, and although I agree that you can't uh, make that diagnosis perhaps well in you with, with lab tests uh, because your antibody titers will remain positive for a long time, you can make it clinically very well. And I, I think it's safer to do the treatment than not to do the treatment. That's, uh, that's true with, within limits. I, I could go into the details of the testing. There are ways to tell somewhat of a difference that way, uh, but uh, generally that's true. Thank you. Yeah. We do have a question from a WHMP listener. Let's all grab these things right now <laughs> and bring them closer. Uh, those of us on the radio, we'd like to eat these things. So um, <laughs> bring them a little bit closer here. Everyone should do that now, and now we're cozy. There we go. This is a question from a WHMP listener. She has a, had a bullseye rash when bitten by a tick in the past. Does this mean she will always have this reaction? Anybody on the panel who would like to take that? Ken. I'd like to explain what the rash is. So sure. what, what, she's seeing, what you're seeing when you see the rash, and the reason it's so diagnostic, is that's the disseminating bacteria moving through your body and it's the uh, reaction that your body has to it. So every time you get that exposure, if you're going to have the reaction, you will have that rash. Thank you. Here's, um, we have a number of questions, Bill Newman. if I might, from some uh, members of the audience, and they have to do with the testing, which a number of the panelists have commented on, so perhaps we could have some clarification here. What percentage of the testing is accurate, which is to say, are there false positives? And if there is a positive test, can that occur months or years if it wasn't originally diagnosed as Lyme? In other words, can you at least you get that diagnosis as a positive test that's helpful in the diagnosis months or years later? Microbiologist, do you want this one? <laughs> Professor Rich? Yeah, so I think there's a dangerous tendency to take a test years after exposure, like a tick bite, to a tick bite and then to hang a lot of symptomology on a positive titer. Given what we just talked about, the fact that a titer can linger for a long time, if symptoms don't show up for a long time after the exposure, it's, it seems a weak inference to, to, to connect those symptoms with that titer that's, that's been around for several years. What's that word you're using? Which word? Titer? Titer is uh, the count of your antibodies in your blood. So it's the percentage of, uh, of your response to the, to the thing that the, that's causing the disease. The other part of this is that the, most of the Lyme testing is antibody testing. And if you understand the signific significance of that, you're not looking to see how much bacteria is in your body. You're looking to see what your immune system is doing that in response to the infection. So, you know, some of the controversy comes from uh, the fact that different people have different immune reactions. Uh, there's some thinking that some people have a robust response to this bacteria and will create the rash. I heard an immunologist speak at a conference who actually felt he tested foresters who got many tick bites, and he thought that you only develop the rash after the first bite, that the, the immune system kind of got in gear so that subsequent bites um, with rashes indicated that they weren't first bites. You know, there's just so much to this, and it, it's really a shame because I think the um, patients and the medical professionals really get caught in a, a really, you know, thorny area. Laurie has another question from the audience. Yes, I am not 
diagnosed with Lyme for a while. My first blood test, I tested three for three and 10 for 10 for Lyme. So it was not a happy day for me. But um, I'm wondering, like all the anti-inflammatory drugs and all that, I mean, I did dicyclamine for 28 days twice in a row. I went and had um, a spinal tap test. I did all that. Um, I used to work on a lumber mill and nail pallets, and now I don't work at all. I was just wondering what some of your alternative medicines are. Alternative treatments for Lyme disease? Yeah, I mean, I tested three for three and 10 for 10. Am I always gonna test that? I've been tested three times. I mean, I've been to infectious disease. I've been, you know, for arthritis test and x-rays. You know, I'm going for an MRI next to my back and my neck. I mean, I get bit all the time, even though I spray. How am I gonna know if it's like recurring or if I really never got rid of it or? Well, this, this brings up the whole controversy of, um, is this a persistent infection in you or is this just your body trying to recover from a big infection, so-called post-Lyme syndrome, which I think of as chronic fatigue syndrome following Lyme disease. Uh, personally, I think both uh, both conditions are real. Uh, in other words, in some people I do believe that there's an ongoing infection that has not been adequately treated. The idea that three weeks of doxycycline or amoxicillin will cure all Lyme disease has always seemed odd to me since I can't think of any other bacterial illness that has a hundred percent response to any antibiotic. So you may have a partially treated or undertreated um, disease that's persistent, or your body may have been overwhelmed by that infection, like can happen after a very bad flu or a pneumonia, and is having a very hard time recovering so-called post-Lyme syndrome. So as you can see, the treatments would be uh, somewhat different. In other words, if you have a persistent infection, you have to do things to get rid of that. Um, the, the standard would be a longer course or a different course of antibiotics. The alternative is usually some sort of intensive herbal treatments of which there's multiple protocols. Well, speak into the mic if you can. Oh. <laughs> Here comes the mic. <laughs> but, but the other part of that is, the other part of that is how to recover. And I, I, I'm not one of the, the docs who treats Lyme disease who thinks that all you have to do is take the right antibiotic now and you'll be fine. I think that that can be part of the treatment if persistent infection is the issue. But you have to do all those things that you would do if your diagnosis was chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia syndrome. You have to get enough rest, you have to eat really well, you have to manage the stress in your life, you have to exercise a little. Um, and you know there are some herbal things and some nutritional support things that could be very helpful. We've got about a minute to break here. Sheila Statlander, maybe you could answer this question. This is from the audience. Is the federal government uh, research system working on a vaccine that you know of? Um, there was a vaccine uh, several years ago, Limerix. Um, it was taken off the market. It was controversial as to exactly why that happened. Um, you know, I think uh, patient groups and some doctors said that there were patients having adverse reactions. Uh, a patient with a certain genotype, the HLA-DR4, I believe it is, would be susceptible to sort of um, autoimmune reactivity. Um, the manufacturer pulled it off the market citing bad sales, and the patient and advocacy groups got blamed for bad, you know, bad publicity killing the vaccine. I think that was really unfortunate. I think it was, you know, complicated. I think there are several efforts underway. Um, the problem is that we don't understand this illness very well. Let's, we uh, let me interrupt. Let's pick that up after the break. Uh, we have to take sort of very precise breaks here for the radio. Um, you're listening to uh, TikTok, sponsored by the Valley Medical Group and Valley Home Improvement, a collaboration between WHMP, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and Northampton Cable TV. We'll be back in one minute. We're back. We're at the JFK Middle School. This is our TikTok, our live community forum between WHMB, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and Northampton Cable TV. This will be broadcast tomorrow morning, by the way, on WHMB 96.9 or 1400, 1600, 1240 AM. Let's uh, pick it back up with uh, Sheila Statlander. We were talking about the r research. The, the vaccine. Can people hear me OK? Um, I'm a, I know I don't always project. 
Um, I think that with vaccines, it would be lovely to have one. One of the problems with this illness is there's so much that we still don't know and the science is still out. Um, we would argue that there aren't clear endpoints for when the disease is done. We can't test, you can't really culture the organism early, uh, easily enough. So how do you know if a vaccine is effective? Um, so I, I think that's also generated a lot of you know, controversy and um, dissatisfaction. But there, there are some efforts underway. Um, they taught, I think the Limerix vaccine, there was something about, you could probably speak to this better than I can, they were actually vaccinating the tick and trying to... Um, vaccinating the mice. So an important thing to bear in mind about Lyme vaccine is it doesn't give any protection in the form of what's called herd immunity. So things like polio that has been virtually wiped out by vaccination, smallpox that's been wiped out by vaccination, me measles, mumps, rubella, they all count on the fact that if enough of us get vaccinated, then the rest of us around sort of, we benefit because there's less disease around. But we aren't the sources of infection because I don't get Lyme disease from my neighbor, I get Lyme disease from the wild. So if I get vaccinated, I'm not in any way reducing the incidence of transmission. So you have to vaccinate basically forever. You never can vaccinate your way out of something like Lyme disease. Why is there a, vaccina a vaccine for pets and not humans? Uh, <laughs> Laura, answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> because it will protect the dog. Uh, it's, the same, uh, it's the same vaccine, actually. It's a recombinant ospe. Dogs don't have lawyers. <laughs> I wanted to bring in Maria Malaguti, who is the executive director of the Lyme Disease Resource Center in Northampton. Now, this is a, fi a relatively new center, correct, Maria? What is it that you do there, and, and what kind of resources do you offer uh, people with Lyme disease? Uh, we haven't actually opened our doors yet, uh, but we do have a website and a telephone number where we can answer questions um, from the general public. We will have a center that people can walk in, um, have time to think, because this disease does get complicated and um, people are concerned, they're angry, they're frustrated, they might not be getting the right answers or the answers that they're looking for. Um, we're going to try to guide them towards local resources where they can get the answers that they need. Um, some people need financial support, so we'll connect them with places like fuel assistance or a food pantry. Um, but we want to stay away from the controversy and the politics <laughs> and have a more calm environment um, where people have time to really sit and think um, and voice their concerns. They're a clearing house of information. Correct. For the most part. Um, Maria, um, Lyme patients used to be accused of hypochondria. Uh, <laughs> some doctors used to insist that this was all in their mind. Uh, with this epidemic we find ourselves under, have, have things changed in that regard? Not really. <laughs> um, my own personal story started in 1997 um, and when I ended up in the emergency room after being progressively ill over a year, um, the doctor wanted to give me Prozac. Um, two months later I tested positive for Lyme. Um, and I've been on disability for a very long time uh, and worked very hard to try to find this, what's going on with this disease and um, why I'm sick and the way I'm sick. And uh, it's complicated. It's not just Lyme. It's uh, autoimmune issues. It's other disease issues that uh, come into play. Kristen, did you have a question? Uh, I did. We've been getting some questions in from uh, Twitter. And uh, one of the questions that they've got is, uh, what happens when your doctor and you don't agree on a Lyme treatment regimen? So I, maybe some of the patients can answer that. <laughs> Hello. Um, I mean, I have really good doctors now, thankfully, so I might not be the best person to answer this question. Why don't, doctors we, why don't we just, maybe we can go backwards a bit. Someone <laughs> tell us, what is the protocol? I understand if you catch the disease very early, you're going to get the, the uh, uh, 
antibiotics for, what, 28 days. Got that. Let's say that doesn't happen, which what seems to be what most of the conversation is about. What's the tipping point? And you have a test which will come up positive for Lyme, I understand. What's the protocol after, if you're 60 days later, 90 days, or four months out? What do you do then? And then I'd like to get to the question of what happens when you disagree with the doctor. But first, what's the protocol? There's more than one protocol and uh, different people. It was a simple question. That's yeah, well, answer. different people do different things. So, uh, for example, if you got a tick bite uh, and you knew that it was on for 24 hours or 36 hours or 48 hours, um, what do you want to do? So around here, the common thing is to give uh, two doses of uh, doxycycline, a 200 milligram dose of doxycycline one time um, if there's been no symptoms and it's very early. Uh, personally, I, I know what I would do if that happened to me because it did happen to me uh, about a year or two ago. Um, and I took, I think, 10 days of doxycycline because I, I didn't want to wind up like a long-term patient and I just thought doxycycline's safe. So the protocol varies. I, I've been in the office of Lyme doctors who would have given somebody a month or six weeks or two months of double antibiotic treatment with that. So there's no standard depending on who you talk to. The standard in the medical community, if you look at what the CDC says, is don't treat until you either get symptoms or you have a positive test, which is for me, sort of like rolling the dice. What if you have a strong immune system that keeps this um, contained for a long time, and then you don't feel that sick, but six months later, it comes out of the box, and you start having symptoms, and you don't even remember that tick bite. So there's no actual standard protocol. As Sheila said, there's too many variables, and there's too much unknown. G given that, if I could follow up, and if to any one of the panelists, is there a problem with having insurance cover the various protocols? <laughs> <laughs> you, you really like the simple I hit questions. it wrong, Herb. I'm sorry <laughs> about that. I didn't know. Yeah. Um, you know, I just wanted to add, add to what Dr. Brummer was saying, that, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the testing schema is designed really to rule out false positives. Um, the uh, Infectious Diseases Society of America has a two-tier process. Are people familiar with that? so that you, you do an ELISA test first, and if it's negative, you stop. If it's positive, you go on to rule out a false positive with a, a second, more complicated test called the Western blot. Um, <clears throat> the ELISA can have a, a large number of false positives, cross-reacts with other organisms, so that is a real danger. But it's also true, and this, I, I don't know how well accepted this is, but there seems to be a lot of good evidence that there are false negatives as well. So many people get stuck there, they're told they don't have Lyme disease, and then there begins their saga. Um, there are two, you know, at the risk of overgeneralizing, there are two kind of unfortunately polarized approaches to treatment. One is using guidelines as, you know, strict formula. You use this two-tier testing method, if it's positive, um, on the ELISA and the, and the um, Western blot, then you treat, but you don't treat longer than 28 days. And that, that's pretty much the idea of the guideline. Um, there, at the other end of the continuum, this an organization I belong to, uh, ILADS, or the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, takes a position that because the testing is so faulty, the science is out, um, we need more research, um, Lyme disease must be made on the basis of a clinical diagnosis, where you look at the patient's symptoms, you take a careful history and you use the laboratory testing to back it up. Um, it's very important if you do that that you have a doctor who's familiar with kind of the full spectrum of symptoms that Lyme disease can cause. You know, a lot of people don't realize that there are neuropsychiatric symptoms that can occur. Um, <clears throat> or patients are embarrassed to mention them because they're having panic attacks that they never had before. Or, you know, I have a patient who recently had a first manic episode at age 40. Well, he, found, he had a positive spinal tap for Lyme. And you don't develop manic depressive illness at age 40. Um, so, you know, it's very, very complicated. And, um, you know, I, I got into this the hard way because my kids got sick. 
and my husband's a physician. He's an, an orthopedic surgeon. We were, we were fooled. We stopped with the ELISA, and our kids went on to develop pretty significant illness. Um, so, you know, that happens to you, and you see the worst of what Lyme can do. You know, you, you kind of start to want to think more broadly and, and, and differently than if you're just thinking uh, theoretically about it. Uh, speaking about kids with Lyme disease, uh, why don't we bring in Sydney Rackenberg Loisel here for a minute? Um, you were exposed to Lyme disease uh, as a nine-year-old. Uh, you missed years of school, uh, deprived of much of your childhood. I think it's safe to say. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those years of frustration and misdiagnoses? Yeah. So I, when I was nine, I got sick, and we didn't really know what caused it. And I, I was in fourth grade at the time, and I missed all of that year of fourth grade kind of like fighting to be in and out of school but I kind of it kind of resolved itself it was very it was a very difficult time obviously being a little nine-year-old not knowing what's going on and having I had really bad headaches that was a main symptom and a lot of anxiety and joint pain but we didn't know we didn't really realize it was all connected um, and I did have a Lyme test at that point and later we found out that one of the titers was positive, but you need to have two to it, for it to be reported, something along the lines of that. And so, yeah, we didn't know. And then I, I, it resolved itself, as I think it sometimes does. And I got sick, I got another tick bite, which I realized that I got a tick bite in 2000 I don't remember. I was in. I was 14, um, and I missed another year of school. And I we got a positive Lyme test that time, and so I started seeing a doctor in Connecticut who's really well known for pediatric Lyme, Dr. Jones. And I've I've been on antibiotics since I was 14, and I'm or 13, and I'm 20. So, um, uh, yeah, we've. I've taken oral antibiotics. I w took oral antibiotics for about two years before we started IV treatment. Um, and I had PICC lines, which are like permanent IVs in your arm. And I had them in both arms. That wasn't very fun. And then I had, I was giving myself oral, I mean, IV treatments of antibiotics twice a day. Then I had a portacath, which is in your chest. And yeah, I was, I was, I'm doing very well now though. <laughs> You have no symptoms today? No, no. I do have I do have symptoms today. I, I still have headaches. No. I mean yes. Well, no. The question was <laughs> did the insurance cover it? Yeah. Uh, some per parts of it. It was a big it's been a battle with the insurance company which thankfully as a child I did not have to personally deal with. Um, but I think that's very hard for really sick adults. Um, you, you were, you were, this is the classic case of being diagnosed too late. Are you yes. bitter about any of this? I mean, here you are, you're going to college, you're traveling the world and all this. Uh, how did you get to the point where you are now? I mean, you had to have been frustrated and bitter about things. I yeah, I mean, I was. I was very, uh, often during high school I would get really, because I had a horrible, horrible fatigue and headaches, and that made it really impossible to do so many of the things my friends were doing. And so I would, you know, I, I wouldn't want to go out to the movies. Like, I wouldn't want to do something even as relaxed as that. So that was really hard. And it was hard to say no to things that a group of my friends were doing and see them doing it and be like, yeah, this is rough. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, I was, it was really hard, like, junior year of high school. And I was, like, wanting to go out and things. And I was like, but I'm so tired all the time. But now I feel like, I mean, it's definitely changed me and ha shaped who I am today in a lot of ways. And I don't think if I hadn't gotten sick, I, I would be. I'm not, like, grateful for it by any means, but I do think that it has made me kind of a better, a better person. And I don't know. I, I didn't do the normal four-year track, like, right from high school to college. I have taken time off and I went to South America. I've done a lot of things that I'm so thankful that I c can do and did do, and I don't think I would have done that if I had just been a normal high school student.
Uh, Sydney, I, I have a teenager now, yeah. and I'm thinking, you know, she gets occasional headaches, she gets anxious about things. Right. Uh, I don't know that I would think to ask her doctor for a test for Lyme disease. Yeah. At what point did somebody say to you or to your mom's Lyme? Well, so when I first got sick in fourth grade, I, like, couldn't go to school. I was, like, that sick. I, like, I was out of school. And... Um, we didn't know about the Lyme test that was po kind of positive. And then when I got sick again, my mom, I believe, asked the doctor to test me for Lyme. And they ended up doing it, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't just like occasional headaches. It was all of a sudden, I was a ninth grader, uh, all of a sudden I couldn't go to school. I was like horribly sick and I was out of school for two weeks I had had mono, and we thought it might have been something like that. I had, it was just very bizarre. And finally, we did the test, and it came out positive, and I was relieved. I was like, oh my god, we know what this is. Now we can treat it. This is so great. It's going to be like, you know, the normal course of treatment is a month. This is going to be awesome. But then it wasn't awesome. <laughs> I think you bring wow. up two really interesting things that diagnosing Lyme is sometimes really difficult and it takes a long time to diagnose it and also treating it yes. you figure out is not fun at all. <laughs> and so I think that what we know is prevention. Yes. That is one thing that is not debatable. You can Lyme disease is preventable and I think with more education treating people take children especially to recognize when they have a tick on them to know mm -hmm. what a tick is if they find one on them and for parents to be checking their children that um, you know, like a situation like yours can be avoidable and I yeah. think that we should have more education especially for children and, um, and I think we have to do a lot more in the schools when kids are going out on field trips um, and they're going into Lyme and tick infested areas there's not enough being done in terms of awareness and education and prevention on that level so um, it's a you know it, there's a lot of room to, to protect people that we're not sort of taking advantage of why don't we spend a minute on that right now and, and list some of the things you can do to prevent this. I mean, some of them we heard a million times, but maybe we could just go over it quickly, the, the classic ways to prevent yourself from being bitten by these ticks. So, so checking yourself is, you know, one of the most basic things you can do once you've been outside. Even if you don't think that you've necessarily been in an area that can have ticks, sometimes you'd be surprised. So if you've been outside, when you get back in, you can check yourself, and you have a pretty big window of time, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you have about 24 to 48 hours, even after, even if you have a tick on you, before any disease is going to be transmitted. So you have a big window of time to check yourself thoroughly, check your kids, check your pets, and also there's other measures you can take if you're going out into a habitat that you know there's probably gonna be ticks there. You can pull your socks up over your pant leg to try and prevent the ticks from getting under your pants and crawling up your leg on your skin. Um, there's a carousides you can use to treat your clothing to try and um, prevent ticks from getting onto you. But checking yourself is, is definitely an easy and, you know, really good thing to do. I've got a, a couple of questions, but we'll, maybe we'll pick that up a little bit later. Uh, Professor Rich, um, audience member, had uh, a question here. The, the blood test is of limited use, apparently, especially after the first exposure. So we, where are we on testing the tick? The gentleman has one in his freezer. Can you explain how your lab works? Uh, what's the best way? I know people can send you the ticks from all over the country, right? Yeah, so we get ticks from about 40 different states, and we can test the tick in the freezer. We can test ticks that are decades or even a century old. Um, but it's very important to emphasize that these aren't a substitute for the blood test. So this isn't a way, this isn't a solution for the failure of the, ser of the serological, of the, of the blood test. This is, I, I, make the analogy between our test and radon testing. What we are hoping to be able to do is tell people about the, the exposures they had. So the analogy works that if you went and had a radon test, you know, if you have radon in your basement, you wouldn't go to your oncologist and say, I have cancer. You'd, you'd realize that you have a risk that's a, the, a risk of getting cancer. So too, our testing tells people about the risk they have of exposure should never be interpreted as a substitute for diagnosis. Um, too often we see people send us ticks, wait for the results and say, well, I want, I want that tick result because I want to know whether to treat or I want to know whether to stop treating. Um, is that, is that if, you, if the tick is identified as carrying this pathogen, does that automatically mean that I've got it? No, absolutely okay. not. 
And thanks for asking that question. Absolutely not. But as Laura alluded, it takes a while for the pathogens to be transmitted, for the, ba the bugs to be transmitted from the bugs into us. So the sooner you get them off, the better. Um, the fact that it's infected doesn't mean that it infected you. The other thing that we always remind people is if you send us a tick um, and we test it, we don't have any idea what the status of the tick that was on the other side of your body that you never saw. Mm -hmm. So when we tell you that your tick is negative, you should not assume, oh, I'm in the clear, I'm all set. Still work with your physician, still work with a physician to get the diagnosis that you need. And, and I, what I, does a person do to send this tick? Do you just put it in a self-addressed stamped envelope? I mean, how does this work? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the first thing you do is you go and you, you order the tick, we, we call it a tick report. Mm -hmm. So tickreport.com, you tell us that you're going to send us a tick ostensibly, we assign a number to it, and then you write that number on the the envelope that you're sending us, send us the tick. When we get the tick and the, and the number together, we test the tick. And then we give the results back to people. And people can go on tickreport.com and see an example of the kind of uh, information we provide. Okay. We have a uh, Bob, question. Can we we have some, I have a real question. Lori's way back there with uh, the audience. I want to add a word of caution, though, about the length of time the tick is attached. Because I think it's, it's very important to realize there, too, there are a lot of individual differences. I know that our pediatric Lyme doctor talked about the elderly and children as having thinner, more porous skin, so that po potentially there could be more rapid transmission. Um, I think that that length of time is based, you can correct me, Dr. Rich, on the time it takes the tick to sort of, trans, to sort of bring up the bacteria from its gut into the salivary glands and um, into, the, into the person that it's attached to. But Willie Bergdorfer, who was the um, researcher who actually discovered the Lyme bacterium and its name for him, Borrelia burgdorferi, said that in some cases the ticks already are found to have um, the bacteria in the salivary glands. In that case, it wouldn't take as long to transmit. So um, I'm not saying this to frighten people, but I just think it's really an arena where patients have to educate themselves about the pros and cons and make really informed decisions about treatment, hopefully with a practitioner who's working with you to, to weigh, the, weigh the odds. We're going to go with Laurie Loisel in the way in the back of the room. So um, I'm here. I'm mostly interested in um, primary prevention and learning about tick habitat. Um, I have found four ticks on my son, and I know for sure they're from his school. Um, we live in the woods, and so we have a routine of like three to four tick checks every day. So when I, I feel that, you know, in sort of preventing anything bad from happening, we really have to figure out where these ticks are coming from. And on occasion, we'll have one in my, my area, my, my yard, but most often they are from the schoolyard. And so I'm really concerned about, um, you know, what, how we can decrease tick habitat in schoolyards and what that really looks like. And I, I know the difference between my house and the school. Um, we have deer fence around our whole property. And so no large mammals can actually come onto the property, and I think that helps a lot. Um, and also, we keep the lawn very well mowed, and we've limbed up the trees, so there's not a lot of low-hanging brush. But I'm just, I'm just wanting to work with the school to give them some tips on what they can do. And the other thing that's so weird about this is that my son seems to be one of the only children who's getting ticks. And so my thought is, well, that's because his mother's neurotic and she's checking him like 25 times a day. So if you have any tips on this, and I have used the lab three times, so thank you very much. It's a great service. Anybody? Yeah, so it sounds like yeah, the, the fact that you're checking three times a day might not be, that, that's great. And so it may be that he's not the only one getting ticks, but maybe you're the only parent finding the ticks. So that's, that's great, and definitely keep that up. Um, yeah, and you can have them, you know, wear light clothing so it's easier to spot them faster. And, um, you know, pulling the socks over the pant legs again to try and keep them at least on the surface of the clothing so you can see them. Mm -hmm. So they don't get underneath the clothing and it's a little bit harder to spot them. Um, but, yeah, it's just, you know, doing the tick checks is definitely, definitely a good thing. 
We're going to take a break here at uh, 6.55 in our evening. This is TikTok with the Del WHMP, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and Northampton Cable TV. We'll be back in five minutes. This is a, a media collaboration with the Daily Hampshire Gazette, WHMP, and NCTV. This is TikTok, and we're going to try to find answers uh, to this creep that uh, crawls up our pant legs and uh, <laughs> gives us these diseases. Once again, our panelist, uh, Dr. Charles Brummer of Northampton, clinical psychologist Sheila Statlander from the Newton area, UMass professor of microbiology Stephen Rich, and one of his patients, one of, not one of his patients, one of his students, <laughs> she is one of his students, <laughs> Laura Miller. Also, we have Maria Malaguti from the newly founded Lyme Disease Resource Center. She's the executive director of that nonprofit. And college student Sydney Rackenberg Loisel, who suffered with Lyme disease since she was a small child. Our questioners, of course, are Bill Newman from The Bill Newman Show, that's heard every morning on WHB from 9 o'clock. The web editor from the Daily Hampshire Gazette, Kristen Palpini. And WHB News Director, Denise Vozella. And I'm Bob Flaherty. We're going to start off our second hour with Bill Newman. I'd like to go back and ask Sidney rackenberg Lozell a question and have the other panelists pick up on this as well, because I was struck when you were talking, Sidney, about how you've been suffering this from this disease since you were nine years old and you're 20 and you're on antibiotics, you're still on antibiotics. So here are the series of questions I'd like you to address and the other panelists too. Are your doctors telling you that you have to be on antibiotics forever? Is that the prognosis? And what does that mean in terms of your long-term health? What are you told? And there is a question from an audience member as well saying, is the protocol best if for continuous antibiotic treatment, or should there be periodic breaks from antibiotics and then go back on them? So those are the series of questions. Uh, let's start, if we could, with you, Sydney, and then I'd like the other panelists to please give us your opinion. So because I got Lyme when I was so young, um, my doctor says, and still says this, that I can be totally cured. I still question it occasionally when I'm feeling very unhappy. Um, but yeah, so I forget the second question, but. The question is what's what, in the future, what's the long-term prognosis okay. in terms of, is what happens when you take antibiotics? We hear so much about don't take, don't overdo antibiotics because of the negative Health, health consequences of that, it seems to me that taking antibiotics for decades probably has some consequences. Probably, but Lyme disease has worse consequences. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not yeah, debating no. that. I, 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 mm -hmm. I know, but I mean, I, there's a lot of people who are really skeptical of people on long-term antibiotics, and I've experienced this myself. Doctor, I go to a different doctor, not for something Lyme-related, and they hear the list of medicines I'm on, and they're like, like, are you, what? is what is wrong with you and like what is wrong with the people who are treating you and I mean it works it's I'm proof of that I was so sick when I was little and I mean recently I mean I was so sick and it's been the antibiotics I know I mean there's other treatments that are really good but nothing worked in the way that antibiotics have for me nothing no other kinds of treatments and I don't, I mean, I think long-term, long personally, from my experience, that's the only way to fully, fully kick Lyme disease in the butt. <laughs> um, and I don't know, I, like, the thing that really turned me around was the IV antibiotics, like, really committing to doing that. And I did try, there were periods of time when I, I mean, I was never like stopping and starting. There are some protocols that are like, take it for three months, stop for a month, take it for three months, stop for a month. And I was never, I never did that. But while I was sick, I did try to go off antibiotics multiple times because I wanted to live a more normal life. And I, I couldn't, I crashed. And there's something called a Herxheimer reaction, which is when you start the antibiotics and all the Lyme cells or spirochetes like explode and they make you feel a hundred times worse. And so that would happen whenever I would stop. And that also would happen whenever I started a new antibiotic. And it's, it's horrible. It's like, you're like already sick and you feel like so much worse and you're like, this is not good. And the doctor's like, just wait it out, I know. Um, and so that, I mean, 
that would happen when I would stop at, and after I would go back on, and it just wasn't worth it to try to go off for a while. <laughs> Dr. Brummer, you think that's right? The uh, antibiotic treatment is, well, indefinite, if not forever? No, not indefinite. Not indefinite. Okay. So, so first of all, there so give us some hope. Oh, okay. <laughs> and how, how, de how, how definite? Okay. So first of all, there are just like every other illness, uh, there are um, degrees of Lyme disease, even chronic Lyme disease. So I like to tell some of these uh, personal experiences I've had with patients who come in with what you would call persistent or chronic Lyme disease with uh, systemic symptoms uh, in the neurologic system, in the rheumatologic system, et cetera, who've had it for sometimes even years, who get treated for relatively short time periods and do very well and come off their antibiotics in a short time. Do you know at that point that they're cured? Do you say you're done? We know this for I, with a reasonable degree of medical certainty, you're cured of Lyme disease? Well, as you said, there's no simple questions. So uh, I thought I had one. Yeah, it, it, so, yeah, I'd like to answer it like that. So I used to do that. So I used to have somebody like that come in, and sometimes they'd come back after two weeks and say, all my symptoms are gone, and I would say, good, finish your other two weeks of antibiotics. You're good. You're golden. This is great. And I do believe I'm telling the truth when I say every single one of those patients wound up coming back to me later saying all my symptoms are back. That doesn't mean you can't cure it, and I do think that clearly it's curable from my perspective. Not everybody feels that way, by the way. There are many uh, doctors that do a lot of Lyme treatment that think you can only contain it, but you can contain it well enough so that you're not having symptoms. So um, maybe you might think of it like uh, the, the oral herpetic outbreaks that most of us have or something like that where only only happens once every five years or something and then it goes away. Uh, some people feel like you can only contain it that way you don't completely eradicate it. I have a feeling you can completely eradicate it based on my own experience. And I've seen that. Sydney had a difficult time. She had a very difficult time. And I, and I know her case. and. You know, she was, she was diagnosed with chronic persistent headaches for a while and was given uh, very potent uh, headache medicines, which just made her sick and didn't treat her headaches. She was given other medications from other doctors um, that just didn't work, but the antibiotics did work for her. So there is, there's definitely hope, even in really hard cases like Sydney's. Look at her. She, look at her. She's vibrant. She's alive. She looks good. She feels good. And I think there's even more She's hope. She's not all that impressed with adults, bigger, older adults. <laughs> no. Or intimidated, I should say. Yeah. Holding yeah. your, more than holding your yeah. own on yeah. this panel is what it means to say. But, but I saw Sydney years ago when she was suffering from her full-blown Lyme. This is not the same person. She, she was prostrate. You know, she, she couldn't get up. She couldn't stay up. She looked terrible and she felt terrible. Now you're seeing the end result of a good treatment and she's doing really well. So that's positive. That's hope. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you I've had many patients with chronic Lyme disease who respond very promptly to single antibiotic treatment. They don't need triple antibiotics and this and that and they don't get better. But under treatment's common. Short, too short a treatment is common. And, that's, and that is a big problem. Sheila Statlander, a clinical psychologist, uh, has joined us. And she's driven all the way in from the Boston area to be with us tonight. So we're very lucky and grateful to have her. But I wanted to ask you, what are some of the psychological symptoms that you see that are due to a Lyme disease? Um, well, I think that I think of it in two um, distinct categories. One is the reactive kinds of issues that people have when they're not well. Um, you know, they can get depressed, they can get anxious. Um, and especially, you know, it's hard enough to be sick, but to be sick with a controversial illness that people don't understand is incredibly stressful, and it's very isolating. So I think uh, support groups and centers like the ones that Maria is talking about developing are very important. And I've certainly tried to work with the support groups in our area. When my kids were getting sick back in the 1990s, we really had very few resources. And there was a myth that, uh, that Lyme only existed on Cape Cod, the islands, and the Berkshires. Um, we had deer in our backyard in Framingham. Now it's recognized that Metro West is also a hotbed. And of course, it's, it's also changing over time. 
But the other thing that can happen, I think Dr. Brummer was um, alluding to, is that Lyme is, the bacteria is what we call neurotropic. That means it's attracted to nervous tissue and the nervous system. So I see people coming in who are afraid that they're developing Alzheimer's disease, um, early dementia. Um, they get diagnosed with attention deficit disorder because they are experiencing cognitive changes, hard time concentrating. Some of those people are losing their jobs. Um, kids, are, kids' grades at school are dropping. Um, so th those are telltale signs. That doesn't mean every time somebody presents that way that it's, you know, Lyme disease, but it's one of the clues. And there are published uh, reports of, um, you know, cognitive decline with Lyme disease that can be possible. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, it certainly happened in my kids' case. Um, they all developed severe uh, issues. My daughter couldn't read for a long time. Um, my son had uh, um, looked like he had attentional issues, and my youngest developed auditory processing problems, which made it look like he was losing his hearing. But it wasn't his hearing. We had it tested. It was his brain process. That cleared up on antibiotics. Um, that made true believers of us that there was something to these treatments. Um, but you know, sometimes if you don't live it, you just, I, I tell people, if I didn't live through this, I probably wouldn't believe even what, what I'm hearing. Um, I, I did want to say something about the long-term antibiotic use issue. You know, it is a concern. We worry about it. Um, when, when is the disease over? You know, what I say to people, it's maybe an unfortunate comparison, but if someone had cancer, you wouldn't sort of cut the cancer out, do the treatment, and then ever look again. I mean, it just makes sense to monitor yourself, you know, and to have a doctor working with you to make sure that you're okay. In terms of the antibiotics, um, there are other illnesses where there is a protocol for long-term antibiotic treatment. We seem to forget that sometimes. Um, kids were prescribed, ac you know, two years of antibiotics for acne without, you know, any question. Uh, we have tons of antibiotic in the food chain. You know, animals are fed antibiotics that are being passed on to people. So it's not just long-term treatment for Lyme disease that's the issue. Um, there are things you can do preventively. Dr. Brummer can um, speak to that um, better than I. But, you know, probiotics. You know, how many people get diagnosed with Lyme, get put on an antibiotic, but the doctor says, make sure you take a probiotic? You know, often that doesn't happen, and that can, you know, ward off problems with the gut. Um, so these are, these are, you know, difficult issues, but I think kind of the controversy is making some common sense answers harder to find. And, um, you know, sometimes what I try to do with folks who come in is to tell them, first of all, that I'm not a medical doctor and I'm not there to offer medical advice, but I help them navigate and understand what their options are. And that can be very, very relieving for them. Um, I want to remind people that uh, people listening at home, uh, you can call our producer at the radio station uh, at 586-7140, talk to Michael Sokol. He will uh, send uh, text messages to Denise and we can get that on the air. Um, I'm going to go to a question in a minute that is loaded with uh, exclamation points, uh, so we'll get that in a minute. But uh, Laurie, you have someone from the uh, back of the room. I'd like to ask Dr. By the Brenner. way, I should ask you to uh, state your name and where you're from, I suppose. Um, Larry Rankin, I live in Florence. Um, Dr. Brenner, I have a question. Uh, earlier, you uh, referenced chronic Lyme disease when it is sometimes in the phase that we might otherwise call chronic fatigue syndrome, recognizing that that's a, a difficult diagnosis to make. You alluded to uh, alternative treatments that can be helpful. I wonder if you could uh, give us some data uh, about the efficacy of nutritional changes, nutritional supplements, dietary changes. And are there studies that can guide people uh, in regard to those modalities? Otherwise, one can spend a lot of money and uh, really not get anywhere. So in terms of natural protocols for chronic fatigue states, which, which I prefer uh, that uh, label rather than chronic fatigue syndrome, um, but chronic fatigue states, which can happen in so many uh, different areas. Data, I, I don't think, no, I don't think I have good studies to point you to in the use of uh, multivitamin or coenzyme Q10 or something like that for, for that state. W what I will tell you is that many people who do natural medicine um, use those things with good result. Um, I, I don't have a study to quote you for that. 
I have a, a, a question here from uh, one of the uh, people that's here. Um, I have heard in Germany they have a 100% Lyme DNA test. Why don't we have it here? Also, they have a vaccine taken on an annual basis. Someone please speak to that. Maybe Dr. Rich or Sheila Statlander. Well, we have a Lyme DNA test here, too, that's 100% effective. It's just not useful for di diagnosing disease in humans. Uh -huh. okay. well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask about uh, something that I was reading about. Um, in Connecticut, they're seeing that there's a cousin to Lyme disease that is also transmitted by tick, and I'm not even sure I'll pronounce this correctly, Borrelia myamodi. Yeah, okay, so you're familiar with that. Something else we have to worry about now with, with ticks is, is not just Lyme disease, but other diseases as well? There are dozens of known pathogens in these ticks. Borrelia miyamotoi, Borrelia burgdorferi, Borrelia lonsleri are just the types that are associated with Lyme-like symptoms. There's also something called Anaplasma phagocytophilum, Babesia microti, a whole alphabet soup of Latin names. Some that are like uh, malaria-like symptoms, they have malaria-like symptoms. Um, and those are just the ones we know of. There are actually hundreds of species of bacteria that live inside every tick, many of which we don't even know what they do. Some could cause disease, some probably actually help the tick to do things, just like bacteria in our gut do. So we're just touching the, the tip of the iceberg of what goes on in the ticks. And the Red Cross has, has gotten involved in this because they're afraid that the people are going to get these pathogens from so the, the blood supply. The primary source of infection from blood transfusion is the Babesia microti, one of these tick-borne uh, malaria-like illnesses. They now screen the blood for the presence of Babesia. Uh, several years ago, there was a death attributable to a Babesia infection from a person that received a transfusion in Connecticut. Mm. By the way, uh, Dr. Rich, uh, you've got students here from your outreach program, and they've got tick ID cards and tick tattoos. Can you <laughs> explain that for a minute? So we have small uh, plastic cards that show there's actually three different species of tick here in Massachusetts. Um, this distinguishes between those three. There's no such thing as a safe tick necessarily, but some are safer than others. So we think it's important that people can distinguish between those different species. Um, and then we d had the idea to take that tick card and make it into a temporary tattoo that kids can put on themselves so they can see what the tick looks like on their skin. They see the actual size. And the ones that are associated with Lyme on that card and on those tattoos have little red circles on them so that they can see the difference between them and hopefully make the distinction. You mentioned kids. I mean, I can qualify for this as well? <laughs> sure. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> All right. But Bill, did you have a question? Um, speaking I, I like of kids, I, I just wanted to say a, a little bit more about the playground question and the schools because I, I don't think we really address that. There are things that can be done to make playgrounds safer. Um, you know, typically, you know, they talk about keeping the, br the brush away, having clean borders, um, using um, bar uh, bark mulch so that the, tick the ticks can't jump across into the, into the lawn area. And a big one is where you put the play set. You know, usually they put it in the shade so that the kids aren't bothered by sun, but then the ticks thrive in the shade. They get dried out in the sun. So there, there are, you know, things to, to look at. There's a, a website called Tick Encounter. It's at the University of Rhode Island. It's sponsored. And there are a lot of prevention tips on, on that website and, and probably elsewhere. The Lyme Disease Association.org has a lot on children. I have a number of questions from the audience having to do with kids and to any one of the panelists. One has to do, one asks, are there pesticide based repellents that are reasonably safe to use with kids that are effective? Another question has to do whether or not kids, particularly younger kids, are in fact more vulnerable, uh, infants, uh, toddlers, and the like. So. How about those two questions? I'd like to set the record straight about repellents. There's almost no compound that repels insects. So the things that we buy that, we, that are called repellents, they actually mask our signals that give the, by which the mosquitoes recognize us. So we put things on us that make our smells be hidden, and they re mosquitoes recognize us by our smell. Um, so nothing repels. It doesn't, it's not as if the mosquito is coming towards us, it has that bad smell and it goes away. So DEET. Uh, cedar tree oil, any of these things are not true repellents. They are effective at keeping mosquitoes off you because of this thing that they sort of, they make us stealthy. 
How about ticks? They're not particularly effective against ticks because the way ticks feed is different than mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are flying around looking for someone to feed on. They're, they're basically uh, raptors. They're, they're predators. Ticks don't do that. Mis ticks hang out in the end of the vegetation. They wait for us to come by. The ticks that we have here, different ticks do different things. The ticks that we have here in Massachusetts, they're just ready to ambush. And so nothing about masking ourselves or covering ourselves is going to reduce it. What is effective are the acaricides, the things that kill the ticks. So these are things that you don't put on your skin, but you put on your clothing that will actually kill the ticks by exposure. But obviously there's more concern about putting chemicals on you that would kill a tick about potential side effects for the per person. Could you, Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, could you address the question of whether or not there is in fact a Lyme disease epidemic that has been caused by any number of factors perhaps you want to identify because going back 30, 40 years, I can't remember a discussion about Lyme disease. Is because we've discovered the disease or in fact there is just simply a lot more of it? So epidemics are in people, deem the Greek word for people. This is an enzootic. This is a disease that's in wild population and that's key for us to understand. For, for the disease and for the ticks, we're at, we're at dead end. The disease is actually being transmitted in wild animals. And that's the answer to why we have Lyme disease now that we didn't have 40 years ago, because we have a different configuration of our communities here, our, our wildlife communities. We have deer in abundances that they weren't present 40 years ago, that they weren't present 100 years ago. Um, and because the deer are so abundant now, the question that came from the back, that's why the, deer, the ticks are so dense. And when ticks are dense, ticks are moving pathogens around in those wild populations at greater, uh, a greater extent than they ever did before. So it's not, it, it is a problem in people that we get sick from it, but we are not the source of the problem, we are the, res we are the, the unhappy recipients of the problem. Are there deer ticks in, uh, that get transmitted to field mice that get into our homes in the winter? All pathogens, all the pathogens we talk about, almost all of them, are maintained in white-footed mice. It's white-footed mice, and those are the mice that will, you'll find in your box of cereal, in your, in your camp, or uh, under your, uh, you know, different places in your home. Um, they are the, are the source of the infection. Not the deer, not us, not your dog, not the raccoons. They come from those white-footed mice. So those are in our homes. Is there a concern that they could somehow transmit, the, transmit Lyme to us in our homes? Only by a tick bite. Only by a tick bite. But, but the, the ticks are on the mice. And, and with the, the ticks are on the mice, yeah. So ticks pick up infection from the mouse, and then they do their thing, they molt, they, they go to their next life stage, and then it's the, basically it's the teenage ticks that are, then, that are then the challenge to us because they've acquired infection from that mouse, and they're serving to shuttle it to the next mouse, or if we get in the way, it, it comes into us. When you look at lists of um, risk factors for contracting Lyme disease, one of the items tends to be the presence of an indoor-outdoor animal, whether it's a pet, a family pet, or a wildlife that gets <coughs> in. So I, I think there is a, an added risk. Yeah. We want to go to Lori Lozell here. You have some folks from the audience that want to weigh in. Hi, my name is Lois Pere, and I'm founder of Kick the Tick uh, Lyme Disease Awareness and Support Group. Uh, I have Lyme, probably the same as Sydney, and I congratulate you on sitting on that panel and being strong for yourself because I too have a catapult and I get IV antibiotics every day, which in my opinion is the only thing that keeps me alive because when I'm taken off of it because the doctor has to take me off or he risks getting in trouble, I end up really sick again within six weeks. And I lived in a hospital for three years and I'm not going back that route. Um, so there, you know, part of my frustration is the lack of doctors, infectious disease doctors in our area that take insurance. Um, I know Dr. Broomer takes one but most of the others don't take any insurance. So the people in my support group are left without care, uh, just digging through the internet, looking for a place of hope. But one of the people in my support group who can't be here tonight, I am hoping 
perhaps Sheila can help me. We're going we're gonna to have to take a break, and let's, let's come back to that. Um, it's uh, 7.25 right now, so we have to take a quick break. This is only going to be a 60-second break, so you can't really stretch your legs much. But uh, we'll be back with more with our community forum, TikTok, with WHMP, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and Northampton Cable TV. We'll be right back in one minute. Uh, we have a question that's been lingering here for quite a while, and maybe we'll direct this to Dr. Brummer. Uh, now, Trexone, uh, a lot of people have had success treating Lyme with this. What can you tell no, me about not, this? Not treating Lyme, but treating the autoimmune reaction that follows Lyme disease very frequently. So it's well known that uh, most Lyme infections um, produce an autoimmune response in the body, which can be um, have symptoms that are quite similar to Lyme disease um, or sometimes different. Um, naltrexone is usually used in uh, medicine at doses of about 50 to 100 milligrams to help narcotic addicts and alcoholics stay off of their uh, drugs of choice because it blocks the opioid receptors. But at very low doses, it's been shown, uh, low doses being like three, four and a half milligrams to help the immune system to self-regulate itself so it stops the autoimmune response, which is, means that the immune system no longer attacks the body. There's been a lot of research done on it for um, multiple sclerosis, uh, some for rheumatoid arthritis and the other inflammatory polyarthropathies and Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And not so much research done with it for Lyme disease, but if somebody's symptoms following Lyme disease are substantially um, associated with an autoimmune reaction, in my experience, and I think in the experience of many uh, people who treat Lyme disease, that this low dose of naltrexone can be very effective. Uh, I'm sorry, we didn't, uh, this young woman right here, you had a question for Sheila Stadlander, and uh, we didn't get to the end of the question before we had to go to break. Go ahead. Um, uh, one of my members, his wife is very sick. He can't leave her. They're telling him that she has Lyme, but she has Alzheimer's, or it seems like all her symptoms are Alzheimer's related. How do I know how to guide him to give him some help? I'm not sure what to do. The medicine the doctor, the infectious disease doctor put, her, put him on has not helped. And we are in a desperate situation with this gentleman. You know, it's, it's hard to answer specific questions about patients not knowing them and not, you know, doing a careful history. And, of course, I don't do the medical. Um, and we have a lack of neurologists who really are, have devoted themselves to this issue. I think partly because of the controversy, doctors are understandably re reluctant to wade in. Um, there is some research done by Judith McClossey and um, Alan McDonald, who, uh, which they claim to have um, sort of in autopsies looked at Alzheimer's plaques and spine, found spirochetes. So there's some, some indication that it can occur. Um, I think it's if you find a doctor who's open-minded and uh, a patient who's, you know, game for it, sometimes a course of antibiotics is w worthwhile. In this case, it would be, have to be something that crosses the blood-brain barrier, so that implies um, intravenous treatment, and that, that can be hard to come by. Um, but, you know, you have to kind of educate yourself and find your options and, and look around and see who's available. It's not easy. When I talk to um, Sydney's got a comment. Hi. Um, <laughs> um, I just earlier we had been talking about how psych and Lyme, psych stuff and Lyme, and I, I just would like to add that um, that is what happened to me. Um, it w well, kind of. It was misunderstood, and um, that was really traumatic for me as a little kid, being misdiagnosed and thinking it was like psychosomatic, is that the right word? Um, or something, yeah. And we, you know, that is really, really challenging. Also, um, the autoimmune conditions, that, that also happened to me. Um, and one thing that really helped me, which is kind of hard to get access to, but a good thing to think about is um, I had, I had IV, I had IG, 
I don't, Dr. Bummer. Intravenous immune globulin. Yeah, IgG treatment. Um, because I had a specific type of autoimmune response after the Lyme disease, um, which was very, very helpful and helped me make leaps and bounds. <laughs> And, and Sydney was able to get that very expensive, very difficult to come by treatment because she saw the one Lyme neurologist in this uh, eastern part of the country who was able to get that for her. That's not an easy thing to get. We had two. One's out on her own medical leave right now. It's, it's really a, a travesty. People were asking about insurance before. Um, I will, I, I think my group that I've been working with will kill me if I don't mention that there is a bill before the state legislature right now. It's House Bill H412, H4142. Um, and the idea behind the bill is to give physicians more sort of freedom to treat, diagnose and treat Lyme according to clinical criteria. We already have a physician protection bill that protects these physicians from being brought up on charges before the medical board, which has been happening in some states. Um, because the treatments are so controversial. But now that we've afforded physicians that right to diagnose and treat according to clinical criteria, patients are having trouble getting the treatments paid for. Um, by and large, insurance companies are relying on the infectious disease guidelines um, to decide whether or not somebody really has Lyme disease or not. So um, I do think that there are cases of people who think they have Lyme who maybe really have something else. But I've seen many cases of what felt like very clear-cut cases that got missed by faulty testing. And those people are struggling to get treatment and to pay for it. And this bill is really addressing protecting those folks. Um, if people want to know more about that, there's a call to action right now. The, the bill has progressed through um, some committees at the State House. Um, it doesn't, it's not endorsing long-term treatment, it's endorsing um, it's in endorsing kind of the freedom to make clinical diagnoses and uh, to put the responsibility and the um, decision making between the patient and the physician rather than having the insurance company decide. And right now when the jury is out and we, there's so much that we don't know, we feel that that's a, a just solution. So if folks want to know how to, um, they want to sort of support that bill, um, feel free to leave me your email address, and I'll make sure that you get the information. Could I ask, does retesting for Lyme make sense? I mean, once there's a negative test, that doesn't mean that two months or three months or six months or a year later, there'll be a negative test, does there? Does that mean that or not? That brings up an interesting point, which is the health of the immune system. So if you don't mount an immune response right away and you get a negative test, that, does that mean you won't mount an immune response later and produce antibodies again? Just to say you're carrying Lyme, but the test says it comes out negative. Right. And yes, it can be. In fact, I think Sydney is a case in point, as a matter of fact, that she had multiple negative tests before getting strongly positive tests. Um, and, I, and this happens, and it happens not infrequently. The immune system, we, we, there was a question earlier about um, the epidemic of Lyme disease. And I think you have to remember that our immune systems are also important. Um, in, in Chinese medicine, which I studied before I went to medical school, there's an idea of the terrain, which means what about our internal environment and its ability to fight infection or to contain infection? How healthy are we? And so I, I really wanted to emphasize that, you know, people keep talking about prevention, which I totally agree. Do the, do the checks, um, you know, roll up, uh, put, put your pant leg into your socks and all that sort of thing. But also keep your health as in top condition as you can. Keep your immune system really healthy. That will help protect you. As uh, Dr. Rich said, not everybody who gets a tick bite that is infected with Lyme develops Lyme disease. Of course, not all the ticks have it, but if the tick has the Lyme, still not everybody develops it. Why is that? You have a really strong immune system, it'll take care of it for you. Similarly, people were talking about recurrences. How about later? How about later? Keep your immune system really strong. You decrease the likelihood of, uh, of a further recurrence of your problem. 
Maria Mal Malaguti, who is the executive director of the Lyme Disease Resource Center of Northampton. It sounds like it's really important who your doctor is when you suspect that you have Lyme disease. How does one go about finding out if their doctor is Lyme literate or finding a doctor who is Lyme literate? There are lots of online resources um, that people go to in chat rooms. They share names. Um, they share experiences. Again, um, our center will be a peer-guided center, so people will be sharing strategies and doctors that have helped them in the past. Is, there, is there one clearinghouse for this kind of information online that you can suggest? Lyme Disease Association. I know that ILADS, somebody mentioned, Dr. Uh, St Sheila Statlander, you mentioned ILADS? Uh, ILADS, but also um, the Lyme Disease Association um, and uh, Tick-Borne Disease Alliance um, all have links that can guide you towards uh, so-called Lyme literate physicians. Um, it's very controversial, and each person uh, needs to tailor their uh, team of doctors, and it, it probably shouldn't be just one doctor if it's a chronic condition, uh, to their needs. Um, speaking as a patient, personally, I had terrible luck uh, with antibiotics. Um, I've had bad reactions. That's my personal experience. I've seen people do wonderfully on long-term antibiotics. Uh, it depends on how the person gets sick. Kristen Pelpini. We have uh, a, another question from uh, Twitter, and uh, this one is about repellents. I know we spoke about them already, but this person has a very specific question. Uh, they want to know if wearing insect repellent clothing with active ingredient permethrin is safe for long-term use if you work outdoors. It's relatively safe. Um, it's not as safe as DEET. It's an acaricide. It means it kills ticks, so it's a poison that's designed to, to target uh, target the uh, the ticks themselves. Um, yeah, it's just it's one of those things that want, that someone that people have to make the the uh, calculation of whether they want to take that risk or the risk of getting bit by a tick. Well, what's the risk of wearing something with permethrin? It's the risk of having any chemistry on your uh, close to your body. Yeah, does it work? It does work. It's extremely effective. So the ticks will die before they get, so ticks start low and they crawl up and usually they'll die before they get halfway up your, their pant leg if you have an effectively treated article of clothing. It's like having rain, like putting rain on Yeah, you wouldn't, right. I mean, it's essentially a toxin, so you have to weigh the odds. And the answer is probably different for very young children than it would be for an adult. Um, when you talk about DEET, the concentration of DEET recommended for adults is higher. It's not, not safe in children, so, it, you know, you have to be careful. Been a lot of people waiting to uh, weigh in. Laura, you have someone? My name is Nancy, and I'm from Leverett. And uh, um, I was treated in the early stage for Lyme about four years ago, and it seemed to be completely successful. But I'm sort of hyper alert to symptoms that might come up. and. My question, Dr. Bremer partially addressed this, but how likely is it that the Lyme is, I understand the antibodies are still there, but that the disease has gone from my body and how likely, or someone's body in my situation, and how likely is recurrences in people who have been, who have been treated in early stage and have been healthy for many years? I, I think your history tells the story pretty well. You've been healthy for the last four years after what sounds like a successful treatment. I think the likelihood that you will develop chronic Lyme or persistent Lyme disease down the road is very small. I, I wouldn't say it was zero. Um, I have seen some people who uh, had that problem later on, even more than four years later. But really, I don't think that's very likely to happen. I think it's very unlikely to happen. Uh, Laura, you have someone else? I was lucky because I had all the symptoms, came on real fast, had the bullseye rash, and they kept me on antibiotics for about three months because I couldn't get rid of the headaches. And so I guess they just thought that was the safest thing to do. That was maybe two or three years ago. And I'm still very prone to headaches, and I've kind of had a, an onset of some fairly significant joint pain. 
but it has been dismissed by doctors as arthritis and aging. So that's what my question is. I wonder how often, you probably don't know, but I'm, I'm assuming that perhaps long-term Lyme disease and joint pain is often misdiagnosed as arthritis and then dismissed. I mean, what I was told is you could take glucosamine and you could, you know, whatever, and that was about it. And I'm just wondering, I'm starting to wonder if it is something related to Lyme and what, what do you do to try to vet that and figure out what's going on with doctors who maybe aren't going to support your journey? I think that was uh, Bill's question earlier yeah. about, you know, well, what happens if the doctor, or somebody's question earlier at least, what, you know, what happens when the doctors are not on the same page as you are. So in your situation, maybe you do just have arthritis of aging or some other, you know, joint problem that is completely unrelated to a tick-borne infection of any kind, and maybe you, but maybe you don't have that. Maybe you do have something tick-borne related. So you have to have a workup. You have to have a history. You have to have a workup. You have to do the labs, and then you have to see, clinically, does this fit? Is it worthwhile to do a trial of antibiotics to see if that helps your symptoms or not? There, there's just a lot of variables. It brings up a, another point, though, which is the potential uh, co-infections of Lyme disease, um, with Dr. Rich mentioned before. Um, there are many co-infections, which I, I noticed that many uh, of our local doctors, even in this high uh, area of Lyme disease and its associated problems, don't test for. Um, uh, Babesia, for example, which is a parasite, um, uh, Ehrlichia, which is usually treated pretty well with the same uh, antibiotics that treat Lyme disease. There's something called Bartonella, uh, which also can cause symptoms. So the question is, could you have a co-infection that wasn't treated early, which is giving you those symptoms? So that should be tested for. Um, co-infections are not so rare, uh, and it has to be kept in the differential diagnosis. Could, can I follow up? I'd like to know if I'm my doctor. When a doctor, a primary care physician, does a series of lab tests with someone presenting with a number of symptoms, is Lyme one of the tests that is routinely done, or does this have to be specially ordered? A lot of people shaking their heads no. <laughs> the audience has answered no, but... <laughs> well, actually, I think it depends on the primary care doctor. Um, I do know some in this area that will um, routinely screen for that if they have somebody with um, unclear symptoms. Uh, because we're talking about neurological symptoms and, and yeah. psychological symptoms and autoimmune problems. I mean, there's a whole plethora of symptoms that could be, could indicate Lyme. I, I think if you presented with neurologic symptoms or rheumatologic symptoms that many, many doctors would screen for that in this area at least. If you're presented with psychiatric symptoms or gastrointestinal symptoms, I think very few would screen for it. You think that's a mistake? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, you know, in my field, what I see happening is people are being sent to me, but for the wrong reasons. So kids who have lots of sensory issues, noise bothers them, light bothers them, they can't sit still, they can't go to school because the fluorescent lights are killing them, are getting diagnosed with school phobia for example, or, you know, kids who, um, you know, social phobia. There are, you know, many instances of kids who are out of school who are brought up on truancy charges and their parents have to go to court and defend the fact that the kids aren't in school. So th this is becoming a social problem as well as a medical problem. And, you know, it's really a shame that we're so, at, so much at odds with one another. What we need to do is to be on the same side and try to figure this thing out. So. Um. I want to ask you a question here today. And, uh, um, maybe I'll direct this to Professor Rich. Um, the University of Rhode Island said that the tick alert is red. They just came out with this report today. Uh, the snowy winter, the wet spring, is going to make for ideal conditions in the next three to four weeks. The nymph population is going to be twice as large as last year's. So this is going to be pretty much an epidemic. Now, I'm going to ask this seriously because some serious, otherwise serious and reliable people have called for the blanket spraying of DDT that we used to endure as kids or extending hunting seasons so that we, with crossbows and everything else, so that maybe we can reduce the deer population. Is this just crazy talk? 
Uh, DDT is not going to come back probably. Um, deer hunting, if you can reduce deer herds, you can reduce the number of ticks. It's been demonstrated, it's been proven on islands where you can eliminate all the deer. For example, we did a study on a small island in Maine where they eradicated the population of 40 deer. It's a mile that's an isle, mile, uh, island that's a mile long and a half mile wide. Um, and they have no Lyme disease there anymore, no endemic Lyme disease because they have nothing to support their ticks anymore. You can't do that. You can't eradicate. That Pandora's box sort of been open. We've got deer here. We're not going to get rid of them all. We're not going to get rid of all the mice. It's always going to be present. It's a question of whether we can suppress it. And we probably could do better at managing deer herds. Why not bring more predators? <laughs> Who'd you have in mind? <laughs> But what does that mean when, when the tick alert is red? What, what are we supposed to do with that, if anything? Oh, so I, I haven't seen the red alert, but I assume this is a tick encounter thing. So yes. what they're emphasizing is that there is a real seasonality to this. So we're coming into the point uh, where the ticks are, uh, it's the nymphal stage. This is the smallest, most dangerous tick, and we'll have them for the next five weeks. That's what we'll be confronting. And people don't always realize but after that five to six weeks when we get into August it's the tinier tick still but they're not infected because they just hatched from their eggs and they haven't got infected so what um, URI is probably referring to is the fact that we've got this window of five to six weeks when the nymphal ticks of which 30 percent of their infected with Borrelia are out there um, biting us. We have another uh, question from the audience of Laurie. Is it true that they can um, feed and then drop off so that you don't, won't necessarily yeah, so ticks make their living by not being seen, right? So right. they have to yeah. stay on it. They're not like a mosquito where they come along, bite, and fly away. Right. They stay on for hours and days, depending on how long. So they make it their business to be very stealthy. They have um, substances that keep you from recognizing their bite. Some people, the person in the back that was saying they were finding ticks on their child, some people get allergic to those substances, and so they have a strong reaction. So it could be people that find a lot of ticks on themselves have an allergy to the ticks. And only 20% ever see a rash. Right. Well, the estimates are 30 to 70 percent. There's lots of things that figure in there. If you've got the rash in your hairline, those of you who still have hair, um, you, you may not see the rash. Uh, if you have dark complexion, it may not show up so much on a dark complexion. So I, I, it's hard to say how many cases of that bullseye rash, how many bullseye rashes there really are. Laurie, you have someone? Hi, my name is Becky. So I'm wondering if you have several negative tests, but you have the joint pain, the fatigue, the irritable bowel syndrome, and you have a lot of these symptoms. What do you do after that when your doctor says, I can't tell you what's wrong with you? Keep finding new doctors. <laughs> it's not for me, it's my court. So, so remember though that um, as I think Sheila said earlier, that Lyme is a clinical diagnosis, not a laboratory diagnosis. And the laboratory tests are done only for confirmation and to give us more confidence in what we're dealing with and how to treat it. But if you have a tick bite, certainly that you've seen, but maybe you didn't see it, um, but you have the exposure even and you have an undiagnosed problem that people can't figure out and you don't respond to the medications that they're giving you uh, the way that you think that you should respond to them and it's just a big mystery. In this area, again, the, the idea is to keep it in mind. Could this be Lyme disease? It's a clinical diagnosis, not a laboratory diagnosis. Um, didn't you suggest that maybe everybody in the panel could give a quick uh, way to contact you? Why don't we start with uh, <coughs> Professor Rich? We've only got a minute left here, so. Uh, the easiest is to go on our web page, which is tickreport.com, or look at UMass's page and find my email. Sheila Statlander. Um, I'm located, I practice in Newton, Massachusetts. The best way is my voicemail at my office. I'm, in, I'm listed. I can tell you the number if you like, 617, 617-965-2329, <clears throat> or I have a very long email address. S. Statlendy, S. S. T. A. T. L. E. N. D. E. at AOL. But Maria Malaguti. <clears throat> LimeDRC.org is our website and best way to contact us. And Dr. Charles Brummer, 
Brummer, B R U M M E R M D, at gmail.com or 413 585 8880. And Sydney? I don't know if anyone wants to. Only if we have sons your age. <laughs> or daughters. <laughs> I don't really want to give out. <laughs> anyway, that is going to do us. Uh, thank you, Sydney. Thank you, uh, Dr. Brummer. Thank you, Maria Malaguti, Sheila Stadlander, Laura Miller, and Stephen Rich, Bill Newman, Kristen Palpini, Denise Fozella, Laurie Loisel, and, and Al Williams from NC TV. This has been a live community forum, oh. TikTok. Brought to you by the Valley Medical Group and the Valley Home Improvement, WHMB, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and Northampton NCTV. Thank you, everybody.